everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I'll be hanging out with you today. It's a rainy morning outside, so I figured it was a good day to knock out a couple videos. Topic for today, we continue on in our series about genetics with a discussion of pedigrees and common genetic disorders. Sounds like rousing stuff, I know. So here are your objectives, and let's get going. Three things I need you to know or be able to do by the time we're finished. First one is to recognize the basic parts and purposes of a pedigree chart. That's probably going to be a review from your basic biology class. Second thing you need to be able to do is to discuss a couple of common genetic disorders and finally relate the age of onset for a disease to disease transmission. So that's where we're headed. Let's start going there. First of all, pedigree chart. What is it? It is essentially a visual representation of how traits are passed through a family or a group of organisms. Um, some of the common symbols used are circles to represent women, squares to represent men, they draw dashes through them to show whether it's living or not, shade them partially to show whether a trait is being carried. We'll talk about all that in a second. But essentially it's a chart for tracking a trait and how it is passed from one member of a family onto the next. It is used for everything from following the pedigree line of some fancy show dog to following diabetes through a family or hemophilia or something like that. So any trait that a researcher wants to follow, as long as it can be visualized in the individuals or in the genetics, it can be followed using a pedigree chart. And the parts of it I just kind of mentioned, some symbols to be aware of are circles for women, squares for men. If a line is thrown, drawn through it, the individual has, is deceased. If it is half shaded, the person is a carrier of the trait. I'm going to show you one in a second so we can talk about it more when we get there. And like I said, I'm gonna show you one. So here we go. This is just a common generic pedigree chart. Things to recognize. Circle, that is female. Square, that is male. If there is a dash drawn through the individual, that individual is deceased. You don't see any on this chart, but on most charts, if someone is a carrier for a disorder, they are half colored. Now by a carrier, I mean that if we are talking about genotypes, this person would have a heterozygous genotype. Let's say the trait we are following through our pedigree chart is a recessive trait, this little a right here. The trait that is being followed through the chart is represented by individuals that are shaded in. So if the trait that you are following is a recessive trait, each of these individuals that are shaded in, they would have the genotype of homozygous recessive. Now, it doesn't look like the person that put this chart together indicated carriers. So each of these shapes that is unshaded, their genotype is likely to be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Either way, the whole purpose of the pedigree chart is to check or track the transmission of traits through a family. Um, Two individuals who have produced offspring are indicated by a horizontal line. Their offspring are all connected via this vertical line that branches out and connects to each of them. And then you can see, if you look below this generation, these are all individuals that have connected with the family to produce more offspring. So this would be like people who have married into the family or had kids with somebody in the family. Um, other things to note, I'm trying to see if there's anything else that you need to note. I don't think there is, but going forward, you're going to have to be able to, and I don't care what class you're in, you're going to have to be able to use a pedigree chart to figure out the genotypes of ancestors. So, you know, a question or a professor or something might say, we know that individual number four has a disease. What is the likelihood that his parents were carriers of the disease? So, quick and easy in this case, since the disease is little a, little a, the only way that he could get it is if his parents were heterozygous. Or if maybe, well, no, neither of the parents could be homozygous because they don't show up as being shaded in. So this is a basic pedigree chart. It's used for a lot of things. I am sure you're going to see them a lot in your biology career. I hope this kind of helps you to get your hands at least a little bit around what it is. Let's talk about some common disorders that are usually tracked using a pedigree chart. And we're going to do two recessive disorders, two dominant disorders. Now, a recessive disorder, the thing that I want you to remember is that they are carried on a recessive allele. So in this case, we're going to talk about cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that causes errors in the production of mucus inside the human body, and mucus ends up clogging airways, 
lungs, and it also gums up the digestive tract. Cystic fibrosis, or the allele that causes cystic fibrosis, is a recessive allele. So individuals that are heterozygous, like this right here, do not have cystic fibrosis, and they would show up on a pedigree chart generally as being half shaded in. Individuals that are homozygous dominant. They do not have the disease at all and they're not a carrier of the trait. The only people who actually have or show cystic fibrosis are people who inherited two little C's. So this means that the parents of somebody who has cystic fibrosis would have had to have been both carriers for the disease. Um, cystic fibrosis unfortunately is usually fatal. Um, without treatment, most kids won't live past the age of five. With some treatment, people with cystic fibrosis can generally make it into their 20s and 30s. Another common recessive disorder is sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is a disease that results in an error in the genetic code that produces hemoglobin in red blood cells. Because of the error in the code, hemoglobin is defective and red blood cells, when they are under stress, collapse. You can see on the left-hand side of that picture is a normal, nice, fat, donut-shaped red blood cell. On the right-hand side is a sickled cell. Those sickle cells, obviously, they don't carry oxygen very well. Because of their shape, they're likely to clone pup, um, clogging arterioles and capillaries. They cause a lot of pain in areas where they clump up. Um, so people who, with sickle cell disorder suffer a lot of ill effects from uh, this disease. It is also a recessive disease, so just like cystic fibrosis, um, an individual has to inherit two recessive alleles before they have full-on sickle cell disease, but some people can be heterozygous and have one trait that does give them some sickling of cells, though they do not full-on have the disease. Now, usually with diseases, we think all of them are recessive because they don't show up in the population all that often. Remember, when we're talking about dominant or recessive, we're not talking about how common a trait is. We are talking about the, uh, I guess, chemicals or the uh, products of that gene. So there are a couple of dominant disorders to be aware of. One of them is achondroplasia, which is commonly known as dwarfism. Individuals who have dwarfism, their genotype is actually, like if we're just using letter A, they are big A, big A, or big A, little a. The gene for achondroplasia is actually this dominant gene right here. So this means that the 99.9% .9 of the population that does not have achondroplasia is actually homozygous recessive for the disorder. So just recognize that even though this disorder is not common at all, technically speaking, the allele that causes it is a dominant allele. So be aware of that one. Also be aware of Huntington's disease, which is a terrible disease, causes wasting of the nervous system. Um, also a dominant disorder that shows up if you have got, you know, the genotype of if we're using H's, we're going to say big H, big H, or big H, little h, you have Huntington's disorder, little h, little h, you do not have it. Now the interesting question is, if an individual has Huntington's disorder, why would they have kids knowing that they could give it to their children? Problem with a disease like Huntington's disorder is the effects of it don't generally show up until a person is in their 30s to 40s. So this means that it is very likely that a person has had kids by this age without having any awareness that they have Huntington's disease. So they had children and it's likely that they pass that trait on to their kids without even knowing that they were sick themselves. We have now gotten to a point where if people suspect that they've got Huntington's in their families, they can have genetic tests that will reveal whether or not they have it, and then they can make an educated decision on whether they want to have kids or not. So that was my quick little tour of pedigree charts and some common just genetic disorders. I appreciate you joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we will see you again. Thank you.